Twitter CEO steps down, virtual reality gets hand gestures, and find out how far one woman went to curb her internet addiction. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 357 for Thursday, June 11th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Today we're going to talk to Alyssa Friedland, a journalist and author of Love and Miscommunication, a new novel about what it's like to give up social media addiction. That's very scary to me. It is not a horror book, it is a romance. But first, let's get to the tech news. This afternoon, The Verge broke the story that Dick Costolo would be stepping down as CEO of Twitter to be replaced by Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey as interim CEO. Costolo himself retweeted Twitter's announcement, adding welcome back at Jack. Costolo's separation from Twitter isn't really a huge surprise. Rumors that Costolo wasn't cutting it have been circulating for months, and investors were not pleased with recent earnings reports. We hope Costolo wasn't constantly refreshing his feed today, otherwise he might have seen that Twitter stock jumped 10% at the news of his departure. Costolo became CEO in 2010 and led the company through their public offering in 2013. He replaced another Twitter co-founder, Ev Williams, who had replaced Dorsey. Dorsey himself left Twitter not so willingly and then founded the popular payment service Square. In other Twitter news, the company announced today that the 120 character limit on direct messages will soon be lifted. You'll still need to maintain brevity in your public tweets, but now you can exchange private messages of up to 10,000 characters to people who follow you. This new development might give Twitter the power to become a bigger competitor to Facebook Messenger, who reported this week that they now have over 700 million users. That's a 100 million increase just in the last three months. And ahead of next week's E3 gaming conference in LA, Oculus showed off the Rift virtual reality headset designed for consumers. They also unveiled Oculus Touch, an input device that lets people reach out into the virtual world. These are codenamed Half Moon. They're little tracking devices designed to make your virtual hands feel like real hands. They allow you to pick up virtual guns and make virtual hand gestures. Uh, there they are right now. <laughs> Uh, and wearing his most fancy pair of flip-flops, which we unfortunately can't see in this video, Oculus founder Palmer Lucky announced that Oculus Touch will be shipping in 2016 and pre-orders will open alongside the Rift. He was actually wearing flip-flops in that announcement, which I don't know why I'm so interested in, but I was. The company will also partner with Microsoft to offer games with Oculus on the Xbox One. The FTC reached their first ever settlement in a case against a Kickstarter campaign gone wrong. Backers of the board game The Doom that came to Atlantic City never got their promised reward of pewter figurines. And not only was the game never produced, but the creator used the $120,000 in crowdsource funds for personal expenses, including rent. The FCC imposed a $111,794 fine, but it was suspended because the creator is broke. And maybe he should start a GoFundMe campaign to help pay his legal bills. And today in Elon Musk news, Wired reports that concept images for Musk's tubular transportation system of the future have just been revealed. The Hyperloop is designed to comfortably pack people into tubes and send them barreling through a giant cylinder at 700 miles per hour or close to the speed of sound. According to one of the companies involved in Hyperloop, a test track will be built here in California as early as next year. Coming up, we talked to a novelist who imagined what it might be like to give up social media. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to develop an app, take better photos, improve your Photoshop skills, or build a new website. lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Do you want to sharpen your coding skills, learn a new programming language? lynda.com's new courses include a first look at developing for Apple Watch up and running with Node.js. There's also the Code Clinic series where lynda.com issues a series of code challenges and authors share their solutions using different programming languages. They just released four new install installments covering Swift, C, R, and JavaScript. 
With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along, or you can search for an answer and skip to that point in the video. And your lynda.com membership also gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's lynda.com slash TN2. And we thank them for their support. Our guest today is Alyssa Friedland, journalist, corporate lawyer, and author of the new book, Love and Miscommunication, which would make a great beach read. Welcome, Alyssa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I first heard about your book when I came upon an article you wrote called Confessions of a Former Technology Addict, Sort of. Can you explain a little <laughs> bit about how bad it got for you? Pretty bad, <laughs> to be totally honest. Um, I was refreshing my Gmail probably twice a minute. I, that's really sad and so embarrassing to admit, actually, but at least I've gotten so much better than I used to be about it. Um, also, the social media stuff, and I, I'm not really a huge poster. I, I post a couple of times a week, but um, I, and I don't even think I'm that curious about other people's lives. I think it was boredom. I couldn't stand, you know, I, I'm in, I live in New York City, so I'm in the back of a taxi a lot. Um, I couldn't stand just like sitting in the back of a taxi and just looking out the window anymore. It was all too easy to just reach for my phone and scroll through the Facebook feed. It was entertainment, but it just got to be too much. I felt like my hand was reaching into my pocketbook every minute to check my phone. And I kind of realized I had a problem. You also said it was a turning point when your son, uh, you took a picture and posted it and your son asked uh, if you got a lot of likes. Um, I oh. think that is a really familiar to a lot of us parents. Um, I know my, my, I have a 12 year old daughter. She had this bucket list for the summer. It was all the fun things. Go to the beach, go swimming, camp out in the yard, um, jump on the trampoline, gain 1000 followers. Like that was right. on her bucket list. Oh, yeah. And I just heard from, uh, some people, my oldest is only seven. So it's a little bit of a different situation. I'm not dealing with like the teenager social media crisis yet. But um, I had heard from a family member who has teenagers that if you don't have 200 likes on your pictures, you're supposed to delete it. It's too embarrassing. <laughs> so that's pretty sad. So you got to this uh, turning point and what did you decide to do? You know, I did go off social media for a while. Um, I didn't actually you know, what, I don't know what the word is, like get a sign out of my Facebook or, you know, get rid of my Facebook delete account. I your account. Just, I, exactly. I didn't delete my account or delete my Instagram, but I didn't check it for a long, you know, at least a month, I would say. I wanted to just experiment with how that felt, you know, to not check it. And it really didn't have any impact on my friendships, which I thought was the most interesting thing. I mean, at first there are people who are texting me, you didn't like my picture. You didn't comment on my picture. Didn't you see? And I said, you know, I'm kind of retreating from this a little bit. And they understood. And I think everyone that I'm friends with pretty much has enough self-awareness to know that maybe they don't have a huge problem, but there's something strange about constantly needing to keep up with the social media rat race and all the constant stream of information. So people were supportive and it didn't change my actual social life. Like I didn't go out less or, you know, have less coffee dates or lunches with friends or get invited to any fewer parties. Um, but I went back to it and honestly, I, I'm promoting a book right now and it would be pretty impossible to promote a book without being on social media. So I'm, I'm fully back on, but I'm better about certain things. I don't check my email first thing in the morning. I think that that just immediately puts you on the defensive for the day. You know, there's just a million people asking things of you before you've even had a cup of coffee or brushed your teeth. I think a lot of people say that they check their phone, you know, before they've said good morning to the person in bed with them. Um, people, I was just talking to a bunch of friends today who say that they, when if they get up to pee in the middle of the night, they look at their phone in the bathroom. They see who's texted, who's emailed. And I mean, obviously they're able to fall back asleep or they wouldn't do it. But for me, I think that would, be too unnerving. So I don't do that. And then at night around like 9 p.m., I say, that's it. And I just put it in a different room um, or I put it on silent and I ignore it for the rest of the night, which I find helpful. So did that experience inspire the book or did it come the other way around? Other way around, actually, because I started the book a number of years ago and I've been lucky, actually, because I think the backlash against technology that I'm perceiving now, or at least um, some more articles being published about people's addiction to social media and technology. I think that that's really worked in my favor. It wasn't even the topic du jour when I started the book. The book came about, I went to my college reunion and it was a very surreal experience. It wasn't 
what a reunion used to be, where you would see people you hadn't seen in a long time, ask them what they were up to, where they were living, because you knew more about people you hadn't seen or didn't even know in college. You knew more about them, you know, five, 10 years out of college than you knew when you were even in school with them, where you probably didn't even know their last name. It was all Facebook. And that experience kind of shook me up a little bit. I, around the same time, my husband and I tried to set up a a friend of ours with a girl whose name was very generic, like Rachel Smith, let's say, and he couldn't find a picture of her online and he wouldn't go out with her. He wouldn't meet her for coffee. And I realized the blind date as we know it is over as well. So those experiences combined. And I thought I've always loved to write. And I thought there's a great novel here. So tell us a little bit about the book without spoiling anything. Okay, sure. So um, the main character is Evie Rosen. She's a 34-year-old attorney um, on the cusp of making partner at her law firm. And I have experience. Um, I was a corporate attorney. I worked at a big law firm in New York. So I wrote, you know, they say, write what you know. I wrote what it was like to work at a place like this. And um, it's not all bad. And I actually like the firm I worked at, but the hours are very long and the work can be pretty tedious at times. And she has uh, a romantic failure and a professional failure uh, coalesce. And she really feels like she just can't keep up anymore with feeling sorry for herself. The, her self-esteem has really taken a hit from social media. And she decides to just give it up for the year and see what happens and let her life happen a bit more organically. Great. So you also write for Pop Sugar. Uh, as you said, you haven't given up the internet for good. Um, and your most recent piece is about what not to post on Instagram, which I really yes. enjoyed. What is your uh, advice for people? What's you know what? Advice? I think I think social media um, is just creating a very egocentric culture. And I, I, you know, I've written a book now and people are always like, oh, it's so amazing. You, you wrote a book. And I'm not trying to be so modest, but I'm like, you know, it's yes, I wrote a book. It's good. I don't want to only talk about myself. I, I kind of have always been against people who think that they're the center of the universe. And I think social media, anyone who has a tendency to have a lot of self-importance, social media completely exacerbates that quality in them because they put out there what they had for breakfast, what, what their new workout routine is. And people like these pictures and comment on these pictures and it just feeds itself. Um, I think it's it's breeding a narcissism that I really have a problem with. And I think that if you post more than two or three times a day, you have to wonder, why do you think anyone is that interested in your life? I mean, unless you're a celebrity and people are, you know, by choice signing up to follow you, they care about every move you make, which, you know, we that's a whole separate discussion that we could have. But, you know, if you're just a regular Joe and you are putting five, 10 pictures up a day of every little move you make, I, I think that that says something about that person's character. It's so true. my advice is be realistic about how much other people care about what you're doing. <laughs> well, you have a point of, um, you know, all the things you'd expect, you know, not pictures of your feet on the beach because um, that will just make people jealous. And food, like don't post pictures of your food. And I, I really don't really understand food pictures. I don't like, I know there are people that are foodies that like to see them, but that's the one thing that I, you know, I just don't really understand. And yet... I was out to dinner last night and I got this beautiful plate of food and I had this instinct of like, oh, I should take a picture of this. So I, I thought, well, why, why it's, sometimes I think it's not so, I mean, I didn't do it, but uh, right. I think it's this kind of, oh, this is beautiful. I want to share it. You know, it's just that right. that's kind of the other side of that. It's not all, you know, I'm so self-involved, but we also should take right. a minute to think about how that looks to other people before we do it. Maybe. Yes. And there's also like, you could go to a new restaurant that, you know, in New York, it's hard. I mean, I'm sure it's hard everywhere. The restaurant business is hard and in New York, it's a competitive space. And there is something nice about seeing a beautiful plate or eating a great meal and sharing it because it helps, it helps the restaurant. And it, it's like, if someone reads my book and puts a picture of it on social media, I'm really appreciative of that. So I think it's really just comes down to moderation, you know? I don't think there's anything so incredible about avocado toast. I've seen it a thousand times. That seems to be the most favorite food of people to post on Instagram, like their their unique variation on avocado toast. I think that's really annoying. But I think if you're trying to help a restaurateur who's got a new place or something is particularly unique about what you're eating, sure, share it. It's fun. I mean, I think somebody, I forget what it was recently, but someone was out for their birthday dinner and they posted a 
picture. Like the cake was so incredible. It was like on fire and smoking and sparkles. It really was amazing to see. Okay. Yes, I get that, you know, but not just like your half eaten chocolate cake. Right. Well, I think when you point out that, you know, now that you have a book and you want to promote it, you know, you, you have to be on these sites. And I think uh, that is more and more of us have jobs where we're creating something, you know, you do and I do. And, you know, I want people to see what we're doing. And, uh, but there is, it is difficult to draw that line to just just put a container around it, especially when you have, you know, families and friends that you want to spend time with and you're not just glued to how many people are liking this on Twitter, how many people, you know, have friended me on Facebook. So, I mean, have you found any ways to manage that, to put a container around promoting your book, promoting yourself online and living your life? Yeah, I mean, when I put a new article that I write online, I immediately want to see what was the reaction? What are people saying about it? Like, will this article I wrote about what not to post on Instagram, will that be insightful? Are people going to say, well, you've posted things like that. Am I going to get that kind of feedback? But I I basically just set mini goals for myself. Like, okay, I shared it. I put it on Facebook, on my author page. This is what I wrote for Pop Sugar. But I am not looking for three solid hours. Like, I should have the self-control I exercise self-control in other areas of my life. I work out when I don't want to. I watch what I eat to some extent. I mean, I don't know if you saw my other pop sugar piece about dieting, but... Um, yeah, for 15 years, you know, you've been dieting. <laughs> exactly. 20 years, yes. Um, right, exactly. I exercise self-control, and I, I think it's just another exercise, just not constantly hitting refresh and seeing how many people you know, commented or liked my article. Cause it can also be really sad when you see that not that many people liked it or not that many people read it. And I don't need to feel this. I'm proud of what I've done and I, I need to not let social media get me down at times. Well, Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us. Alyssa Friedland is the author of uh, Love and Miscommunication. You can buy it wherever books and eBooks books are sold. Uh, you can find out more at AlyssaFriedland.com. Uh, where else can people catch up with what you're doing? Um, my website's the best resource. It has a schedule of where I'll be appearing and you can order my book and it's available at um, Barnes & Noble, Target and most independent bookstores and Amazon, of course. So um, please check up. Uh, and I actually am running a great giveaway on my website now. So a little teaser, people should visit it. All right. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. If you're now, if you're looking for a way to keep your teenage kids busy this summer, why not have them look for a new planet? According to CNET, that's what 17-year-old Tom Wagg from Newcastle under Lyme in the UK did. Wagg found the planet when he was only 15 years old, but it took two years for authorities in Belgium and Switzerland to believe him. Wagg found the planet by analyzing data from an international space project. The planet is a thousand light years from Earth and can't be seen through a telescope. Wagg discovered it when he found an abnormal light curve in the constellation of Hydra, which turned out to be the previously unknown planet traveling in front of it. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.